welcome to the fifth episode of season three of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 12th of April 2010 and in this episode we'll talk about the experience of new users to free software and we'll of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu and feedback. I'm Simon, full house this week. Who should we talk to first? Tony. Hello. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Go on, tell us what you've been up to. Um, I, I've, I've been doing Ubuntu stuff. Wow. Yeah. I installed Lucid Beta 1. I think it's the most. Is that right? We're at beta two now. Can oh. we keep up? Well, all right. I installed it on my laptop. A spare laptop. A test laptop. You have a spare laptop. <laughs> a spare yeah. test yeah. laptop. Well, yeah. That was well, what I said I was going to do when I got given that laptop from Lug Radio Live last year. Oh, did you work out the BIOS password? I did. Yeah. Thanks for guessing <laughs> that for me. Someone's taken um, him this long. Yeah. Um, so, and I finally got around to installing it and trying out the. Uh, I wanted to see what the fuss was about with these buttons on the on the left hand side and. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's great. It works, and it's all good, and I don't see what the problem is. So you're going to lock it away now and wait until the next beta comes out? For well, I'm going, to try, I'm going to try using it just for kind of day-to-day fiddling around email and web and stuff and see what happens. Um, but yeah. Are you going to use the default apps, or are you going to install extra stuff? Well, so far I've used the default apps. So, for example, um, Gwibber, which I haven't used for a long time, so it's quite a big change in, in that. Did it crash? No. Oh. no. That's quite good. But that's about it, really. Um, and I've tried to report a few bugs and got confused. <laughs> That's about it. Bless. You and oh, Bug reporting. Yeah. You and Launchpad don't get on, do you? No. Sorry, Graham. Come on, Popey. Tell us what you've been up to, mate. Um, loads, actually. I had a bug. Speaking of bugs, and um, it's been around for a while, and lots of people have had this bug. And um, I have a, 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 a fix EPCs, and I let a canonical developer um, log on to it. I opened a port, and he hosed my laptop nice. as part of the research to make this to fix this bug and the bug's now fixed in lucid and i think in karmic as well cool so that's good but it kind of made me a bit wary you know in some external i mean he's not a random guy i have met the guy but you know i'm letting him onto a machine that's inside my network mm. you know it's scary it's scary is, yeah, you know did he trash it yeah, yeah, comprehensively. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so, 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 what sort of access did you give him? VNC, SSH. Um, I opened an SSH tunnel to that laptop. I set him up a user account, put his SSH key on it, and gave him sudo. Okay. So he could do whatever he wants. How long was he on it for? Um, well, actually, he he went on it that night, and then the next morning he went, he went to bed because he was in he's in a different time zone. And then the next morning he was on it, and for a few hours I think, and that, that was yeah. it. Very trusting. Yeah. I, 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 it made me think, why don't other people do that? And then I thought maybe they're not as stupid as me. <laughs> <laughs> Always worth a possibility. Mm. Laura, you've been busy this week? Yeah, I also had a book, but of a different kind. Oh, yeah. I was poorly sick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the other sort of bug. Was it good fun? I don't know I why you're looking slept at me. Mo- <laughs> slept most of Friday. Oh, really? Um, but yeah, other than that, I've been odd camp organising. Yay. Yay. More about that later. And I feel like I've I spent about half the week reading and watching the digital economy bill stuff happen. Ooh, yes. It yeah, took being, up a huge amount of time. Yeah, um, this government is interesting. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't actually watch all of it. Uh, it was honest, really good. I didn't need to because Twitter was mental. With it. <laughs> yeah, Tony. that was just Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think you probably watched you know a thousand times more than most MPs anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know most of it isn't even on iPlayer? It's seven hours or something, and only an hour or so of it is actually on iPlay. That's a BBC the... conspiracy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> the edited highlights. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two minutes. Who needs twenty-four? Eh? Yeah, we watched the the second reading on the was it Tuesday, and then the mm. third reading on the Wednesday, and then all the articles on the internet. It felt like it's quite exciting. Though. It was. It was good. Mm. Exciting, eh? Well, it wasn't good, mm. but it was interesting to watch it. Yeah, yeah. Will it affect the way you you'll vote on uh, in May? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes, because I was absolutely livid at the end of it. Yeah, I had someone come and knock on the door and canvass for my vote just before I left <laughs> to come here. And uh, yeah, I gave him a piece of my mind. Yeah. In fact, I was livid most of the next day about it whenever I thought about it. It was really bizarre yeah. how annoyed it made me. Was it just the bill or the way that it no, worked? it was the way it worked. The bill, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important and stuff, but it was the way it was t- uh, treated, yeah. Don't watch it ever again because it's the same for everything. mm, mm. Come on, Dave. You next, mate. Uh, it's been a hectic week. Um, I've been doing a few things. Um, I've been trying to sort of manage time by do, doing the getting things done sort of methodology. And it's turned into getting me frustrated or, or, <laughs> or making me feel bad for not getting as much done as I originally planned. 
Um, but other than that, um, I've had a go at sponsoring someone else's work into the archive. That that was something I've not done before. Mm-hmm. So actually, you know, I uploaded someone else's work, which I, you know, I'm sure they were pleased. Um, and playing with the joggler. Mm. Um, People yeah. have been mad for those, haven't they? <laughs> I don't know what went on there. <laughs> <laughs> loads of people seem to have bought them. Yeah. Or some people seem to have bought loads. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hoarding them. Mm. And what have you been up to, Simon? I've been having a week of hmm, fun, maybe learning. Thanks to you, I've been doing some uh, some triaging and some bug work. Uh, I basically had a spare week um, on holiday, trying not to get in DIY with the wife. Uh, <laughs> so I've been glued to the laptop, learning about um, triage initially, and then applying patches and uploading to Launchpad, and how easy it is, but how difficult it is to understand and learn how to do it all and do it all properly yeah i mean i think uh, it's fair to say that each element isn't actually difficult in itself it's the ordering and just the sheer bulk of things you do it's actually quite a learning curve massive huge i've kind of got a grip of it a little bit but um it's something i want to continue it's actually quite interesting um and i will Uh, it's quite satisfying isn't it (laughs) <laughs> I, I think I think it will be when I've got a grip of it and, and I can do it and um, yeah I, I think it's probably fair to say that Simon's picked up more in a week than I did in six months <laughs> well, that's because I've been bugging you essentially <laughs> how do you do this how do you do that? that part of the problem is that I've been asking three or four different people I, I blogged about a couple of them and everybody's got their own way of doing things uh, and so you ask one person go to the next and it's different from the previous guy so it's yeah so the glass half full way of thinking about that is you've learned lots of different ways to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've been making a lot of notes. Mm. Cool. Having the knowledge, knowledge to hand is, is good. Indeed. Um, so the next person we're going to get to introduce themselves as we've been going around the team, getting everybody to introduce each other in turns, um, is going to be Dave this week. Oh, hello. Hello, <laughs> Dave. So tell us a little bit about you and how people can find you and stuff. Um, well, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a business IT consultant. That, that That's my... You know, my, my, I do Linuxy stuff, uh, web servers, VoIP telephony, and networking, and all sorts of other quite interesting or boring stuff, depending on <laughs> on what side of the fence you fall. Um, I, when I'm not doing that, uh, I'm a Ubuntu developer. Um, I'm a little bit of a columnist for a Linux magazine, oh, yeah. and funnily enough, a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> where do you do that then? Um, where do I do what the podcasting? Your podcasting yeah. Uh, I do that um, on the Ubuntu UK podcast. Ah, yes, yeah, so you you may have heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I have heard of it. But um, other podcasts are available. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I I have a blog, uh, blog.davy.com, which I have many many drafts that are yet to be published. <laughs> uh, I I'm also on Twitter, uh, uh, Davy D A V I E Y, and probably everything where else you can catch me. So that is me. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> One of the people I work with recently joined um, an open source mailing list, a project, for uh, a wiki, which we were looking at installing uh, at work, and managed to get banned with it in... <laughs> banned within, from the wiki banned or banned from, from the, the mailing list? Banned from the mailing list within two emails. Um, really? Now, the people I work with are not Linux users, but they're obviously quite experienced with Windows and quite sort of technical, technically savvy, but not open source savvy, if you see what I mean, um, and aren't really familiar with perhaps some of the ways, uh, the idiosyncratic ways of, of dealing with mailing lists and stuff like that. And uh, there were two problems. One of the posts, the post was in HTML, HTML mail, and there was a signature, which for some bizarre reason that's not worth going into now, was at the top of the email rather than at the bottom. Um, and these sort of contravened the uh, the mail admin's rules, which were, to be fair, you know, on the, wiki, on the website, and got banned. Hang on, sorry, were the rules as a wiki? Because <laughs> um, I, I, I think it might have been, yeah. Um, but the the point was that you know, as, a, as a, a technologically savvy user, um, who'd taken a bit of convincing that this open source stuff might be worth a look at, a look at oh, on, on my behalf, um, this was the first experience of the open source community, which I had been selling as generally helpful and friendly and, and you know supportive. Um, and it wasn't a great first experience. And one of the sort of things I wanted to talk about this evening was just. Um, how that impression uh, gets across to people, whether we as an Ubuntu community give the right impression to, to new users and um, should we be doing things differently? Tricky, isn't it? Mm. Mailing well, lists. Who in this room has been flamed on a mailing list at least once? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And IRC. And that, to us, is an educational experience. 
yes. a painful one. Yeah, but there's there's big there's there's entering into a you know heated discourse, and then there's being kicked off the, the facility, so you can't. Oh yes, I mean I on. I haven't been kicked off of main list. Mm. However, you know I have been told off for top posting and things like that through through my I years. I just ignore them. <laughs> yeah, but I mean what what I'm saying is is that's we we seem to learn the hard way. Yeah. Uh, but for the people mm. coming into it now, should they be expected to go into the same experience? Right, I'm a devil's advocate for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no. D- just for a second. Uh, what, 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 what is the issue with HTML email? And what is the issue with top uh, posting? Bear in mind that most popular software nowadays uses does HTML that. email and automatically puts you at the top of an email to reply. What is the big thing? Okay, the pro- one of the problems with HTML email is it significantly increases the amount of traffic that transfers to get your email. Significantly. Yeah. Significantly difference between oh, yeah. a non-HTML mail and an HTML mail. I'm not saying the difference between a piece of text and a video. Yeah. I'm talking <laughs> the difference between an email that is not HTML and one that is. There's yeah. a difference. But, I mean, in that instance, then why do we use HTML in web browsers, not plain text? Be- for markup. Yeah, because it looks mm. like. But hang on, if you're blogging hang just on, we, text, let's not get away from the point. But my my point is that the all the popular well, software does this, but it doesn't. People don't appreciate the fact that a lot of people that are doing this for work sit and do it on their phones, for example, or the and, work they're, email and they're, client. they're bandwidth issues, or they're using a text um, email client where actually uh, HTML is a is a pain. There are also. Um, what are they called? Where you group all the emails together? Uh, threading. Threaded. Threading. There are a whole host of issues with HTML the email. So, uh, and that's why it's not just somebody going off on a rant for no reason. So there is an issue with HTML. Well, email. well, yeah, but like you say, if you have a decent email client and people weren't quite so obsessive about it, then if everyone used a decent email client and everyone had lots of disk space and wasn't really worried about the amount of data transfer, then it would be mostly a non-issue. Do we think people are too obsessive about it? Yes, I think some people are to the to the detriment of of getting people involved in open source community or at least giving them a positive experience. Yeah, but I don't think that's just centered around the fact that you know you must comply with these rules when you communicate with me. Mm. It's I mean taken to an extreme. You know the the guys in Craftwork who wouldn't answer the phone because they didn't like the sound of having a phone ringing, so yeah. they would just not have no ringer. And if you wanted to phone them. You would phone them, and they might pick it up and hope you were on the end of it. <laughs> you know, there, there are levels of, of obsessive. Yeah, but and and the people who are this obsessive are often obsessive in lots of other ways. I, I, I it's, think it's not just the communication. Yeah, um, but obviously, where people are, people can get involved in the open source community in a number of different ways. They can look at um, open source projects on Windows, for example, and get involved perhaps trying to file a bug against something like Audacity on Windows. They can download a web-based application and try and install it on iOS um, and Windows. They can download a distro and, and get into contact with it that way, for example. And because there are so many avenues, we have no real way of, of measuring the quality of, of the advice they get through those avenues or or, or how friendly those particular communities are or, or aren't. Um, and it's a little bit of a worry for me if we are trying to promote open source and show actually it can do great stu- uh, great things if the, the, the follow-up, the community support and the atmosphere isn't all it could be. But isn't that mostly developers you're talking about there? Not necessarily fellow community people who are just, in inverted commas, just users. It's mostly developers that have this bee in their bonnet. Yeah, but if Possibly. you're a non-open source developer working, say in a college or something and you want to go and get help and you've never been in you're still new to a community and new mm-hmm. to open source even if you are a developer getting yeah, banned but, after two emails is ridiculous well, but you yeah. have to educate what i'm getting at is that there it's i would think that there's users talking to users getting community mm-hmm. support from something like you know the ubuntu forums or something like that then there's users going that next level because it's something you know someone can't help with so they talk to a developer but if you're in your example it's a developer talking to another developer my nature of them being a developer whether they're open source or not would they not have they some are empathy develop- there developers are strange aliens yeah and um they <laughs> so do, whether, whether they do look different but, but no what i'm getting <laughs> Getting at is if if you're you're saying it's a developer who's in a non-open source and you've got a developer in open source and 
surely the two of those are most likely to be able to find some common communication method. Well, Where, whereas users who come from space, hmm. who've never seen this before, and try and talk to a developer, are the kinds of people who clash. Yeah, but I mean, in this particular thing, the stuff that they were getting hung up on, um, like the signatures and thing and HTML and stuff, that's that's something anybody could fall into. I mm-hmm. mean, you can be a developer just because you like hacking around on on PHP or non mm. open source stuff at home or in college, but you've just never been part of a community before. And then you go in and you go, oh my God, two two emails in and I'm kicked out of this new community. What's the point? And I think it, whoever you are, that's going to be a bit of a off-putting experience. But, but, but we have these rules for a reason, don't we? Yeah, but it's not about... It's having guidelines, yes. Okay, or maybe even, rules was the wrong no, word, guidelines. But I mean, rules, but you've got to be tolerant of people. And that goes for the people yeah, who are in there two, already. Ma- two whole males through. Well, know. this is true. I mean, that's just... Told after the first one. We'll get a tweet about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, one of the things we reflected on when I was mentioning this to Alan was whether this would have happened at Hampshire Lug, um, our Lug. And I think our conclusion was a few years ago, it might well have done. Mm-hmm. Not, not perhaps getting banned, but certainly no. getting a lot of people flaming at people for posting in HTML or top posting or, or whatever with or big signatures. I think as, as a group, it's kind of uh, perhaps a more user-level group rather than developer-level group. It's grown a lot more tolerant of these sort of, you know, perhaps non-standard mm-hmm. geeky practices. And people will now get sort of gentle nudges to... to um, change their practices rather than a, a big flame war i think but that, e- even a few years ago that was probably the case because i just remember being bored constantly by people talking about top posting um but that's just the nature of our lug yeah other lugs yeah. will yeah other lugs are available and, <laughs> and other, alan's in all of them <laughs> no i'm not anymore i'm in none of them and some of them near us actually are incredibly less tolerant like 30 miles down the road, they're incredibly less tolerant. I think mainly because they're more developers oh, and okay. possibly more longer term people, more in inverted commas experienced there. And they, you know, they'll, they'll have a go at someone very quickly for transgressing one of the written or unwritten rules. <laughs> but Hans has always had quite a policy of being invited of inviting newbies into meetings and things so that's, that's it's possibly culture, a culture yeah it's, it's culture a cultural thing that's built up yeah. of people well, and and so that that culture that happens in in one place like i know jono blogged about this a few years ago when he tried to get help with myth tv there was a culture yeah. at the time that if you go into the developer channel and you ask a you know a, a question user about question. you know user level question a you'll be told to get lost and go somewhere else or b you'll be told you have to check out the latest version from subversion you can't use one of the releases we're not going to talk to you until you you know you, you test and make sure that that problem still exists in subversion head or something and it's it's those kind of cultures that build up that that mm. i don't know do we have those in ubuntu some of it's just would, general would happen, politeness, isn't it? Would that it? happen on an Ubuntu mailing list? Are we, is codifying it in a code of conduct and you know having great big wiki pages with mailing list etiquette riddled through it, is that helping us to and helping us to become less like that? Well, or do we just suppress it? Uh, have you seen that sort of event happen on Ubuntu lists or does the code of conduct... Yes. And recently, uh, right. the two the two main lists that are pretty much out of hand, I think I can say, right. are Ubuntu users and Sounder. Right, and th- you know, a, a, a thread can start very quickly, become twenty, thirty, forty miles long with people yeah. bitching and moaning at each other. And the thing is, people quite often dismiss what the person is actually saying. And then we'll pick up on things like their use of grammar, mm-hmm. and and you know, and to me, you know, if you if that's all you can comment on, you've lost the argument. Mm-hmm. Whereas most of the mainstream mailing lists, like the UK Loco list, I mean, take a point today. There was a, a thread about um, the digital economy bill, and yep. he said digital, digital equipment, equipment court again, again. <laughs> digital economy bill, and someone posted their opinions about politics and so on, and it was raised by someone else in a very polite manner that. You know, politics is possibly a bit off topic for an Ubuntu UK local mailing list. And there was a bit of discussion about whether actually it is or mm. isn't. And someone said, oh, I didn't expect a flame. And then everyone took a step back and was like, well, actually, that wasn't a flame. You were asked really politely. And, you know, and that 
that seems to be mostly the way it works in the Ubuntu mailing list. But I'm, I'm wondering if there are actually plenty of developers on Ubuntu mailing lists who feel that they want to go, ah, stop top posting, ah, stop yeah. sending me HTML. But they don't because they know that the code of conduct is there and there's this overriding, actually, I should be more tolerant or I'll send them a private mail or, you know, point them to this URL to help them. I, that's I'm, good if that's the case because I can understand the frustration, but you don't you, have to take it out on new people who are you do You know. do often see, you know, people having a good rant and they'll get a reply that says something like, actually, this is the wrong mailing list and <laughs> here's the answer to your question anyway. Yeah. Whereas on some non-Ubuntu mailing lists, I'm not saying Ubuntu mailing lists are perfect and you know all non-ones are rubbish, but on other mailing lists you might see someone say, "Don't ask the question here, get lost." Yeah, but the the other thing is is I mean I've seen uh, last year there's a particular thread that comes to mind where someone was, um, I, I think they had, they had some problems going on in their life, and it was clearly a thread which you should enter with great care. Uh, it was it was regarding Ubuntu. And there were um, quite big player developers spending time talking to him. And I'm thinking, you know, you, sh- you, you should really spend this time not, n- not speaking to this, to this user. The developer shouldn't. But the, you know, the particular developers, I would rather, were, were working on the crucial operating system. Mm-hmm. Uh, because th- this user didn't have a problem with, with the operating system. It was, it was other aspects. It was quite difficult. Um, but... I mean, personally, I think that if it's something, if it's a thread that's going to make you angry where you're going to get involved, it's just best not to reply. Yeah. But there's also <laughs> the view that maybe developers should talk to users a bit more. Well, just we, throwing it out well, there. Yeah, but the, the problem is we've, got, we've now got um, Ubuntu devil mailing list, which is where some of the developers... Where all the devils to, are. The devil used to <laughs> hang out. And then there was created Ubuntu devil discuss mailing list. And I think that was trying to get the discussion off of the developer mailing list. So actually pulling people away from developers or taking the discussion away from the developers because they were just wasting too much time, as Dave says, replying to mails, inane mails, some of them. And some of them, you know, very lengthy, I want to know why you've made these decisions and, you know, how can we change this and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, these people are busy. Rather than discussing the actual what they're doing. Yeah. We had an email from Charles Stewart Forstall, a a listener, which perhaps reflects some of the other side of this argument. Um, And and he's sort of saying that the um, the community or the Ubuntu's community general attitude of distrust and condensation towards average end users (laughs) is one of open source's primary failings. Um, And that um, uh, it's not a way to win converts to the cause. I've had to paraphrase this a little bit because it's quite a long email. Um, But basically... um, we uh, don't always ha- open source will never grow if it's opponent proponents like yourselves including us um which have the lack of knowledge and experience back in the face of the average new joe or user so in, in one sense it's it's sort of saying don't talk down to users and, and sort of i guess you know feed them little tidbits or something the other and the other on the other hand um don't make that the problem the fact that they aren't experienced so uh, it's clearly that the, there's a bit of a perception of, of of there being a problem out there, but perhaps not quite clear how to how to tackle it. Do we spoon feed people, or do we kind of say, "Here's the rules, make your well, own minds up, after, work it after out yourself"? Just sitting and really listening to the conversation, I think Popey probably, as far as I'm concerned, has given the way forward. In that the code of conduct really does help. It's not a magic bullet. No, no, but, but it helps. It, it helps by being civil. That's all you've got to be: be civil and understanding. That's got to help people getting banned for two emails that's that's an that's an absolute nonsense how can anybody expect new people technical people to continue um and have any respect for the product they were trying to look into it's, it's madness yeah well we would appreciate your feedback on this i'm sure um you can send emails to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or find out other ways of getting in touch on our website i would like to throw one question out for our listeners go on then, dave can they contrast this to another situation, such as forums, and see if they've had a similar experience in, uh, in in other mediums as well? I'd also be interested to know in what ways people have been, how how their first um, foray into making a mistake was, yeah. you know, was dealt with. Yeah. Did did you, you know, were you kicked or you know, did were you given a friendly private email? Or, you know, I, I'd be interested to know.
Novellas won the legal fight with SEO, in which SEO claimed ownership of the Unix copyrights, and which the jury decided belonged to Novell. This means that SEO can't claim that Linux infringes their copyrights because they're Novell's copyrights. Hurrah. At long last. Yes. Is it finally over? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on fighting, won't they? Till the death. Of Novell? Well. Aren't they an administration or something, that skull? I yeah, know, for a while. Yeah. They were, but yeah. I thought they were really banking on winning this to yeah, payroll. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. Unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> the digital economy bill, which we discussed in the last episode, was passed by Parliament amid a frenzy of tweets by geeks, surprised by how few MPs were in attendance. Some last-minute amendments softened the blow for photographers, but the main clauses about internet disconnection made it through. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this in the intro. I yeah. think we'll probably end up talking about it again in the feedback. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting watch. Who here watched it? I watched some I, yeah, of it. I watched some of it, yeah. yeah. I, I wrote to my MP about this, oh, and, yeah. he, and he replied saying, oh yes, I totally agree with you. Something needs to be done, but they're doing it all wrong. If we were in power, we would do it differently. Mm. Well, a bit late. <laughs> and you know what? He didn't even bother turning up to vote. Uh. Same here. <laughs> Long-time manufacturer of printers useless to Linux users, Lexmark have changed their tune and now even including little Tux logos on their hardware. Graph makers extraordinaire Pharonix have reviewed the new Pro 905 and found that it works really well. They're binary-only drivers, aren't they? Well, mm, maybe. I mean, I know that's how Brother do it, and they actually work quite well. Yeah. And actually, uh, some of HP ones are also so. It would be nice if they were just, you know, if it was just a file that they give to mm. Till Campita or whatever his name is, the yeah. printer guy, and just say, put the driver in and sorted. If everything, if everything talked PCL or PostScript or whatever, life would be a lot easier. Yeah. When, when I worked uh, more in the proprietary world, uh, there was certain code I wouldn't release because I wasn't <laughs> proud of the contents. <laughs> right. It worked from one end to the other. <laughs> I suppose at least the good thing is that people who've got a Lexmark printer can now get some support well, for it. Well, many of them already did work. It's, it's really the desk jet, the kind of um, consumer-grade hardware that's that's been improved by this. But things like when they're built-in scanners and that sort of thing. Ah, Maybe I don't know. I don't know. I've never. I've not bought a Lexmark printer <laughs> since I knew that it would be <laughs> world of pain. Well, quite. IBM has caused consternation by pursuing the open source Hercules mainframe emulator used to run the Big Blue ZOS with patent infringement claims. This is despite two of the patents being included in IBM's 2005 patent pledge not to use them against Floss projects. Boo! Mm, I see. Mm. Does this make IBM one of the bad guys? I don't know. I think it's been blown up a little bit out of proportion, perhaps. I think there's a lot of question marks left in that in that article. Yes, uh, including a response by the VP of Open Systems Development, who say they stand by their pledge not to sue any open source software projects um, under those patents. So mm. uh, maybe there's some question marks about. I think it's more a letter of non um, asking them not to compete mm. um, with IBM more than you know they're not suing them. Google have announced on their blog they're investing in an ARM port of the Og Theora decoder. Yeah, so it'll be on, on chip, basically. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. Which means it can be done with less battery power and blah 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 And means that you can get decent video playback on low-power devices based so, on ARM. Guessing phones, Android. Mm. Mm. Uh, tablets. Yeah, will be a big... Yeah, yeah. Future's exciting. Mm. The future's Google. So we've got Os Barcamp on April 17th in Dublin, organised by Laura Kuchowski at IBM's Pembroke Street offices. And you can find out more at www.osbarcamp.org. Psst, psst, oi, over here. Do you want to buy this? It's the centre of the open source universe. I picked it up last year in Wolverhampton. Only one careful owner. It's a bargain. Oi, oi, come back. Oh. I'm going to have to find something to do with this. Hold on a minute. Yes, that's right. On the 1st and 2nd of May this year, Liverpool is the only place to be for anyone interested in free software, free culture and free thinking. It's the second live Og Camp event, organised by the Linux Outlaws and the Ubuntu UK podcast. We've taken the mantle from Lug Radio Live and we're not giving it back. The 1st and 2nd of May 2010 at the Blackie, Liverpool. Visit ogcamp.org for more details. Also join us on Friday, April 30th for a special free culture gig. Kick off the weekend in style with some great live music. 
but you might want to leave your hubcaps at home. That's right, we're just two and a half weeks away from Og Camp now, oh, golly. as this goes out. Um, yeah, we're teaming up again with the Linux Outlaws to bring you a weekend of fun and frolics, it says here. Um, culminating in a live recording of a sort of joint podcast affair between us and the Linux Outlaws guys. It'll be great fun. And we're going to have a raffle again. Yep. Um, and It's the Og Camp raffle. The Og Camp, the famous Og Camp raffle. Are we going to record that? No. <laughs> I think we should. <laughs> we, we had a mixed, mixed response to that, didn't we? We had an incredibly positive response considering it was a live raffle. Yeah. I was thinking of doing sort of bingo or something this time around. <laughs> Just reading out a series of numbers. I that would be think cool. we might do the raffle on a different day from the recording. That's a small move. Think. Bingo in binary. Ooh, I like that. You know what you should do with that, <laughs> that idea, Dave? You should put it on ideas.ogcamp.org where That's you can a good put, idea. <laughs> it is a good which, idea. Which is the great site that Fab set up. Yes, yes. but any ideas. I've added one just today, actually. Oh, yeah. What is yes. your idea? Um, uh, it's a talk that I want to give. Ah, so if you want cool. to find out what it is, people will have to go along and either but, to but, the event or to ideas. But we can't Camp. wait. You must tell us now. We'll beat it out of him later. Or you could just visit the site. Oh. <laughs> ideas.ogcamp.org using the laptop that's sort of right in front of you one thing to mention is that just if you put your idea up there you still need to submit it when you get to the event mm. yes do you want to talk a little bit about how the uh, event the idea submission thing is going to work properly okay um, I think so far when you get there <laughs> still being ironed out completely um, but you, when you arrive on the Saturday you can start submitting talks straight away mm-hmm. and at that point and then you can everybody can vote on them in the sense that they can show that they're interested in that talk and we haven't quite figured out how we're <laughs> going to show how we're going to vote whether it's going to be stickers or marks or yeah, electronic or something something yeah yeah, yeah. it'll be great it'll be it fantastic <laughs> yeah. and then um we'll put together the first at least the first half of the schedule then and then you can start going seeing talks and there'll be the keynote by simon yes Oops. yeah that's Web gonna be link. the first thing isn't that's it? gonna kick us all off so that we can get going and then throughout the rest of the weekend, you can still be submitting talks. So if you arrive late, that's not a problem. Um, but yeah, you just keep submitting throughout the weekend until we run out of space or talks. And we've got uh, an exhibition area as well. And we've oh, got a, yeah. a, about 12 exhibitors in there at the moment. Um, wow. I know, it's yeah. looking really good. I was just trying to find the list, but I couldn't, couldn't lay my hands on it. But, um, well, people will just have to turn up. People will just have to turn up. It's but a there's quite some, impressive list. It's quite an impressive list in a different kind of range of, of groups and things. Um, yeah. A lot of free software groups and things from around the country are coming along. Um, which should be really good. And we've got, finally, uh, a, a venue for the Saturday night. Yes. Obviously, there's the Rat Hole Radio Roadshow gig the night before on the Friday. For Saturday night, um, there's been an official pub decided, which is called Studio 2, and we'll put a link up in the show notes. Um, and we're going to be there from 7pm, and it's open to the public. It's just going to be a little area of the pub where we we're can all going congregate. To be there. I think well, we're going to be asleep. <laughs> yeah, people will be able to buy us drinks there. Ah, oh, now, yeah. yeah, now you're talking. But there will be food. There will be food. The chef, they, they can persuade the chef to stay on, um, I think by stealing the uh, tyres from his car. And... Um, uh, it, they'll be there till the chef won't be there till 2am but the late bar will be till 2am so you can yeah. get food and you can get drink and that uh, probably be I'm assuming we're not going to be there at 2am <laughs> we're going to be running the event the next day but that's why we have crew that's why yeah, absolutely <laughs> think Rock Adam Sweet I was going to say who wants to be the Adam <laughs> Sweet <laughs> this time around <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. One thing I just thought about the exhibition, um, there's probably space around if we can, um, is if you've got any I, like demos and things you want to bring along on your laptop, I quite like the idea of having a, just an informal area where people can just set up and show stuff, which people probably do in any way, but try and, that's going to be the kind of the congregating area anyway right. in the exhibition room. Yeah, there'll be plenty so of space around for people to Feel free to, to bring kind of, stuff along like that. To congregate and stuff, won't there? I found the list. I'll Ooh. give you a quick rundown. Uh, Linux Emporium, uh, Liverpool Lug, Bad Format Magazine. Um, there's an Ubuntu demo and install area that uh, one of the Ubuntu UK members is setting up, I think. Um, Open Street Map, Open Rights Group, Susie and Novell uh, are going to be there. Uh, we're going to be selling our fantastic mugs and um, T-shirts. Uh, the Red Hat are going to be there. They're, they're, they've got a 100% confirmed, but they're saying so far they're going to come. Uh, Linux Fund and uh, a couple of possible extra ones as well. So some good good people there. Fantastic. It's a nice mixture of kind of... Four distros. Oh, yes. Yeah. See, we're not just about your Ubuntu. We're right across it. Anyway, it's going to be really, really good. Two and a half weeks. We'll have one more episode before... Sorry, you said two and a half weeks. I thought it was going to be two and a half weeks long. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it just feels like... It's two days like long. Two it's days on long. the first and second yeah. of May. Well, and... Um, 
we'll have one more episode before then basically is what i'm trying to say okay. so uh, we'll then after that have the live episode from the from the weekend and we should mention our lovely sponsors we should indeed who are, are? Linux Format, who are our media partner, and they produced a fan. Well, Fab produced a fantastic advert which appeared in the re- most recent uh, Linux Format magazine. The Open Learning Center, Alan and Alan, two g- great guys. Uh, <laughs> Linux Emporium, uh, not just because their name's Alan. Uh, Linux Emporium, uh, OpsView, Bitfolk, uh, Recruit Twelve, and a new sponsor, Linux Fund, mm. who you may know from such things as. The Linux Fund in credit America, card yes. in America. The credit card people. Yes. So you can support Floss Project by spending money yes. on Excellent. jobblers and things. Excellent. Well, well, we'll see you there. It's the bit about Ubuntu. Ta-da! What's in the bag this week? Since when did we start going, ta-da? <laughs> <laughs> when I put on my sparkly trousers. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, what's in the- Can you do that then? <laughs> <laughs> what's in the magic bag this week? Right, Ubuntu One has a new feature. It now has phone sync for contacts via Funambol. 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 Yeah. Um, it's only available song. for. <laughs> That's Fernando. Sorry. <laughs> it's only available for paid account Ubuntu One users and syncs to many popular phones. Notably, it syncs to the iPhone, uh, where there is, of course, an app for that, but not Android. Mm. I'm interested why it's paid phones only. I mean, do you think that's a scaling... Not paid phones, it's sorry, paid, paid sorry. accounts. Yeah, paid... Uh, yeah, so if you're a Ubuntu one paid subscriber, do you think that's a scalability thing? No, or, it's no. because they have to pay Fanamble a license for support. For each user? Yeah, Canonical pays Fanamble um, license for the Fanamble phone sync product that they're rebranding but under Ubuntu One. each use? Well, I don't know about whether it's each use, yeah. but they pay a support cost, which is why we're yeah. paying for it. So how long before they uh, rewrite Funamble? <laughs> well, that's the thing. They, they, there's not much point in them doing it because somebody's already done the work. It makes no sense for them to rewrite it. What does make sense is for them to write an Android version. Definitely. Because there, right, there, there is an Android 2.0, isn't there, version? Uh, yeah, but it's only in beta, oh. and it's not supported, as I understand it. But there is an app in the iPhone store. This got me somewhat annoyed. There is an app in the iPhone store... And it's like branded Ubuntu for phone sync for Ubuntu One, but there isn't such a thing in the Ubuntu uh, in the Android marketplace. But all the, loads and loads of Windows mobile phones are supported, and iPhone. <laughs> so those nasty closed environments over there are supported. But this little happy go lucky. But, but, uh, but it is actually an interesting service. Basically, connecting your phone to an online cloud service uh-huh. and further connecting it to things like your mail client and things like that and having all your contacts. Yes, well, great. Well, O2 great have been doing something similar like this for, as part of a closed service for a while. They called it Blue Book. Um, and I see from some of the documentation that's using Sync ML, the Ubuntu yep. One phone sync. Mm. So if your phone supports Sync ML, is it likely to be supported or is there more to it than that? Um, I don't know. I, I don't have anything okay. other than an Android phone. No, okay. Fair but, enough. Yeah, I mean... In in essence, it's a great idea having the same contacts in your email client as on your desktop as yeah. are in your phone. And having your phone contacts backed up is great if you lose it or drop it down the toilet yep. or whatever. Or upgrade it and they don't have a smooth upgrade mm. process. Yeah, great. Cool. Sounds like a good one. If your phone's supported. But funny enough, <laughs> you actually already have this by using your Android with Google. Well, yep. you see, that's the other thing. I'm unlikely to pay for this. Because, yes, I have an Android phone, and it syncs to Google, and I can edit my contacts in the browser using the Google interface. Do you think that's why they didn't bother about Android? No, I just don't think they got to it yet. Oh, they haven't developed it yet. They they, haven't developed it sufficiently yet. The actual company behind it did say there was a a bounty for Yes, there is a bounty for someone to develop one, which Mm. would be great. Okay, underneath that in the bag, I don't know what I'm saying bag, I'm imagining a bag. Um, Mark Shuttleworth has closed the infamous bug 532633, which is the which side of the window should the buttons be on bug, um, with a a nice little note saying, um, be quiet everybody, Uh, it's going to be like it is for now, and then we'll review it a little bit later on in the process. But hey, you know, closing Ubuntu bugs, that's what it's all about, we need to get (laughs) these bugs fixed and closed. Yeah. Hasn't stopped the conversation carrying on, though. <laughs> he, has, he said they were staying on the left, but they've switched the order of the buttons around, didn't Yeah, they? so they're the same as uh, um, OS X. Oh, yeah. they? that's a coincidence. <laughs> Fancy do, that. Do we have to get into this? Can we move on? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And speaking of bugs, Matt Zimmerman has made a blog post about uh, a story in numbers of um, the process of a, an Ubuntu bug, or the life cycle of an Ubuntu bug. Yeah, Aww. it's quite interesting. Hmm. 
in terms of... It's a short story, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly a bedtime, you know. It's like one of those little things, little thrips that probably only last you know, an hour or two, and then it's all over. Right. They're the little ones that get caught under screens. I mean, he, he's, basically anyway. to- he's basically talking about someone raising a bug, and from my interpretation of it is um, basically people moaning about it Mm. rather than actually just fixing it when it was actually very quick just to fix. People who aren't even affected by the bug moaning mm. about it. Yeah, I think that was the thing, wasn't it? Somebody blogged about it and then a whole lot of other people from Reddit and other networks jumped in on the bug. So this, is not, this is not specific to, um, to Ubuntu, though. It's somewhat human nature. Mm. You know, you, you remember a couple of years ago, someone did something stupid on the radio yep. and there was a couple of complaints and then a newspaper published a story about it and then suddenly there's thousands of complaints from people who hadn't even heard no. the original story yeah. so in this case aren't exactly affected by it yet still feel the need to complain about it mm. Mm. and that's only going to get worse in my opinion <laughs> well as it up and gets more popular yeah because there'll right. be more and more piece, people who want their voice to be heard mm. whether that's a voice that should be heard or not well, simon what do you think <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't we have a feedback session on this i think we do we probably do if you're running Ubuntu Lucid, you can now try out the new desktop integration with web-based Soho, which is a web-based office suite like Google Docs. And Lucid is using a project that provides Zoho as a web service so that if you have limited hardware, such as a netbook, or you just prefer not to use OpenOffice, for instance, you can open your locally saved documents directly in Zoho, which is hosted on the web. That's clever. Rather cool. So this is after, remember, there was a discussion about them dropping OpenOffice from the netbook version uh, and yes, going, quite with, heavy. going with Google Docs and there was lots of argument that we shouldn't be doing that and so they're using Zoho. But, but Do you know for, the reason why though? The reason why what? They're using Zoho over Google Docs. I don't. It's because Zoho provides this web service that means you don't have to log in and register to be able to use it. It's ah, not, so you can use not it anonymously. a philosophical reason apparently. Oh lovely. But yeah. It's actually really clean integration. Basically you've got a document file on your desktop you double click it and you're in a text you know as in a rich text editor you're in a, in a in browser. browser yeah right yeah nice that, that is pretty clear. and that was done by jamie bennett which um which oh, yeah. is uh, he's a nice, a nice guy he is he's but he's Twitter. so ugly <gasps> <laughs> no the reason i say that <laughs> explanation <laughs> he, you know, well, because I, I thought he was dashingly attractive no he, he, no he asked me to write something for him he said oh you must mention my good looks so. uh, <laughs> a red rag to a bull there so. i suspect so, mental note, make sure I never ask Dave to mention my good looks. <laughs> hmm, how much risk of that? And with Lucid, we've switched back from Google uh, to uh, Yahoo, yeah. back to Google. Oh, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. We've switched from Yahoo to Google. Yeah, well. Hey, it's it's not really with Lucid. Oh, it's, See, it's, I don't not, know about it's not you, really switched for users who are going to upgrade to Lucid. Nothing changed. changed. Oh, yes, yeah. But I'm like, oh, I was a bit confused there for a minute. So we're not, <laughs> we're not, we're not using Yahoo now. As the no. default search. But it it's is still an there option. as an yeah. option, as and, it was previously. And I guess the deal we talked about is still underlying there. So, so um, do we, why was the change then? Um, was it um, <laughs> user functionality? E- user, user experience, user I think experience. it said. Okay. It was Rick Spencer, wasn't he, who posted about this. There hasn't been anything sort of official or, or anything. From, that is official. Well, it's official from, from Rick, but it's not been like a press release or anything. So What's his role? I'm not sure they need to be, really. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's Rick's role? Um, he is... <laughs> desktop team lead, desktop isn't he? Desktop team lead, yeah. I think that's right, okay. yeah. Or desktop manager. Yeah, he's very important. Nice guy. And where can we find out more about Rick's role? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, something's uh, got me uh, today. In fact, the final freeze for 10.04 approaches. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, golly, yes. You've been bitten by that, haven't you? Yes, I have. Uh, basically, that means that you can't make any more changes. Uh, they freeze everything so that um, they've got something to work on to uh, go for the fi- uh, initial release. But you can do stable release updates after the release. Sure. Yes, yeah. but for under strict criteria. At yeah, the moment, right. if you you know want something a bit, you know, you know, you still get <laughs> no, it. No, I don't. <laughs> stable release new, fun- new functionality. Yeah, but a stable release update has to be something pretty, pretty crucial right. or affect uh, majority of the users. Critical with stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even yeah. stuff that's in-universe. Yeah. Wow. So what date's the official release? Targeted for 29th of April. Excellent. See you at the in time pie. for Odd Camp. Yeah, it's in time for Odd Yes. Camp. No, we won't be dishing out CDs at Odd Camp. <laughs> no. And please don't take our Wi-Fi down. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We should set up a local mirror. Yeah. That might be, a, that might be a really good idea. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a very good idea. That, How about we spend... get one of those um, Western Digital passport? Oh, you're not having mine. 300... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fill it up with ISO. Images You'll have four by and then pass it round. It doesn't mean you spend the whole weekend with people coming up to you with your laptop, with their laptop going, I can't make this work. Well, I did, I did think about this. I was actually thinking about it the other day, and I thought we could do that or have a USB stick with, a, with the install, live installer on it. But then I thought, what if some can clown just, decides to put some malware on it? And just then, take a yeah. wireless access point and have it accessible over on, Wi-Fi. Hang on, it's 700 meg. You know, I mean, how many people who are going to this event won't be able to download 700 meg at home or work? Over our Wi-Fi, though. Yeah, but because it's the first day, pretty much, they will do it while Certainly the first weekend, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Especially if they're sat next to someone. Oh, is that the new reason? Oh, I, oh, I want that. that. And while I'm at the Ubuntu podcast. And free Wi-Fi. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not going to be that great an uplink. Maybe we should burn, burn a few CDs just on the off chance to just chuck mm. them out. And, yeah. That'd yeah. be a good idea. Anyway, it should be exciting. Mm. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. Lots of feedback. This could take some time. Someone going by the name of Glutfrog left us a message on our website. It was really interesting listening to your interview with Simon Phipps, even though I don't live in the UK. With all that legislation affecting digital rights and freedom, I think it's important that geeks and computer users in general get political. Inviting Simon on the show every now and then would be great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we had lots of feedback like that, saying they really enjoyed the uh, interview. Um, and Simon blogs quite a lot on his blog, so it's a good way to keep up to date with all the latest Best place to blog. <laughs> blog on a blog. Actually, Shah pinged us to let us know. If any of your American listeners want to contact the powers that be about ACTA, the EFF has a great site, eff.org slash action. Yep, so if you're American, I guess that's the place to go. Mark Johnson writes about his own command line love. You get a taskbar across the bottom of the terminal, including a system monitor and clock, and can use the F keys to spawn and move between multiple shell sessions, all within the same terminal window. This can be really handy if you want to run lots of command line applications at once, like browser, IRC, nano, app, etc. But you don't want to have to SSH in for each one. You can run Bayobu, B-Y or B-U, by typing it in at the bash prompt. Yes. It's fantastic. If you don't use it, you're missing out. I've never used it. It's Have you not? Brilliant. I've never used it. You should. Just enable it and, and you'll, you'll know. I, I turned on a couple of extra things. So now when I SSH to my Myth TV front end at home, mm-hmm. I've got like the date and time and free space and all that kind of malarkey at the bottom. But also I now have wireless signal strength showing in a, in a console when oh, I SSH right. to it, which I think is quite cute. Very cool. That sounds useful. No, I, I know, well, mine's connected by a cable, but, you know, uh, potentially well, useful. I'm just saying that's mm. a useful thing to have at the bottom. But the, the other thing is is uh, to show if you need to reboot, actually. I mean, that's not yeah. something so so much now, because when you actually SSH in, it's, you, it says, you know, system reboot mm. required. But mm-hmm. that was something it did do initially. And show how many package updates and things. Yeah, you get a little red R if it needs a reboot, don't you? Mm. Yeah. A, a little, little coloured... F5 thing. if it needs Bobby restarting. So you just press is that F- what that means? Yeah, just press F5. It's, there's been an update to Bobby and you just... F5 restarts Bilby. Ah. Great. Um, I'll tell you a little funny story Go on, about the command line thing, just as part of the feedback. Remember on the last show I said that I'd um, done my script, which I called Sort, and I sort of glibly <laughs> said, oh, yeah. yeah, 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 nothing's going to possibly uh, use uh, Sort in any uh, anything. Anyway, <laughs> I was pulling my hair out this week with Davey because I was trying to build... Um, a package and it would not do it. It kept I asking know. for my pig in no, password. But it's when you were trying to apply patches, that wasn't was it? it? That yeah. was it. And so the application's called Quilt and it kept asking for your password. Yeah. So I was looking through like the code for like this, pack, this patch application and there's nothing in there that would want your password. Pulling my hair out. Anyway, he yeah. pointed, to go and check your log, see what it is. And it was essentially accessing my script, which I'd called sort. Can I just yeah, say, none of us saw fan. that coming at all. That's a good lesson week. to learn. Lesson, yeah, absolutely. Lesson. We didn't tell you about it last week, so you learned that lesson. Yeah. What have you uh, called your script now? I'll just change the O to a... <laughs> get. I'll change the O to a zero. <laughs> uh, fair enough. <laughs> Dave <laughs> spilled his tea. tea everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Super ah. non-obvious right. script name. Uh, You're leap. <laughs> <laughs> it was anything I could think of quickly. Uh, <laughs> like right. You don't have any time to rename it. Must be renamed now. <laughs> <sighs> right, moving on. Alan Bell left us a voicemail explaining more about his Vote Geek project. It all relates to the general election that has just been called in the UK. On May the 6th, all the Ubuntu UK podcast listeners over the age of 18 will be called to vote 
to choose their representative in Parliament, except for those not British and anyone serving a prison sentence. So the website we've created at votegeek.org.uk has information about each of the 650 constituencies and the candidate standing. If you do nothing else, do go and find your constituency and see who they are so you know which candidates and parties are available for you to vote for before you get to the polling booth. The information on votegeek.org.uk includes the email and snail mail addresses of almost all the candidates and we update it daily as more information is collected. We are encouraging everyone to use this information to contact their candidates and ask them for their opinion on matters of geekiness. It might be that you are upset by the Digital Economies Bill. It might be that you want them to do something about supporting the free software industry. You might want to ask them about encouraging the public sector to use more free software. But the issue you choose doesn't matter, as long as it in some way has a geek angle, and is something that matters to you. Once you've written your letter or email, and it doesn't have to be long, a single paragraph is fine, send it to your candidates and post a copy of it on votegeek.org.uk. And then you wait, hopefully not too long, for the replies and then post the replies to votegeek.org.uk too, so that we can all share the information that you've obtained and be informed voters. So if you're interested in knowing uh, more about your MP and whether he's geeky mm. or not, or she <laughs> is geeky, geeky or not, or how they stand on geek matters, that's the place to check it out. And Alan's coming along to Odd Camp, of course, and I think he's talking about Vote Geek there as well. Actually, yeah. mm. I also heard he might be on our sister radio station, BBC Radio 4, this Friday. Oh, okay. <laughs> A little sister radio station. We do like to give them props every now and again, don't we? <laughs> yeah, people don't know how to find them otherwise. <laughs> oh, really? So what's that about, Dave? I, I'm not exactly okay. sure, but I'm I'm guessing it's about this folk it, geek I think stuff. it's about yeah. folk geek, yeah. Mm. So we can listen to it all day and we'll find out when that is. Mm. Excellent. Finally, on the digital economy bill, Phil Thompson wrote... It's a pity Simon Phipps didn't have an alternative proposal for addressing the piracy issue. Restricting the connection speed and available protocols of a suspected pirate would seem a proportionate response pending investigation resolution and would allow them to do the essential communication things Simon was keen to protect while zapping their BitTorrent piracy fest. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? Mm. Throttling people back. Well, there was a recent case in America. Comcast would, um, uh, who are an ISP, if they detected people doing... uh, significant bit torrent traffic would send the that's the end of the file now packet to the bit torrent client oh, really? yeah and the bit torrent client would just shut down that seems, that that's is a way interesting. of protecting their network yeah in the name of protecting the, the network of- arguably you know well it's tricky if you're in the middle of downloading an iso and you're yeah, yeah. and presumably you can't just restart it it thinks it's finished I and oh, i don't know so yeah. was it all bit torrent traffic i don't know but it just i just remember hearing about it this week okay. and as an example of how an isp might um, you know, count, it, countermeasures. It is an interesting idea, although if if you still had to allow people web access to do things, then potentially you could download pirated stuff via the web. Still, we not everything illegal is put is peer to peer or BitTorrent. Yeah, I mean, I can I can kind of see an argument for having a proportionate response. Maybe you know, cutting off certain protocols and dropping back to only HTTP and HTTPS, yeah. or only allowing access to .gov sites, or you know, mm. something that doesn't completely disconnect people but gives them a clue that they shouldn't be doing whatever it is that they're doing until they talk to their ISP and figure out whether they're actually doing something perfectly legal and the restrictions should be lifted. Tricky to get that balance right though, isn't it, between Mm. what is and isn't proportionate and what is fair and unfair. But then it's between them and their ISP at least. Yeah, well, ISPs already do things like rate limit, but that's more to protect their network, arguably, because you have a small number of people saturating the network with lots and lots and lots of traffic, Mm. rather than what this new act proposes, which is more a third third party says these people are doing something without proving it. Something that does interest me, out of the digital digital economy bill, um, people who are either against it, there's not that many people I've seen who are strongly in favour of it, but those who are against it, how many have actually read the wording? I mean, how many people well, are jumping on the bandwagon? It was very difficult during the debate to keep up with all the amendments that were going back and forth, and, and a lot of the text for those hadn't made it onto the websites, for example. So 
The oh, act yes. is now published and you know, people can actually pick through yes. every single line of it if but they want to. even the proposed one, how many people who were against it actually knew what the contents of it was, opposed to just jumping on the bandwagon and, and going, no, but we can't have then this. Then you'd never get any support for anything or against anything because the legalese that they use is mm. just so hard to go through and That's understand, what... which is why you have people like the Open Rights Group with mm. their lawyers who can translate it. Pull through it and interpret it and give and us the summary. You just have to have a certain amount of trust that they're interpreting it correctly. It could be, you know, if you have got a, uh, a nothing to do with an evening, it can be interesting to pick through some of these things. There. And, and all the documents are available online eventually. Yeah. Callum Craig wrote him with an air of disappointment. Enjoying the new series, still doing a good job. Just one thing has been bugging me with the recent episodes. You don't seem to be able to question any official Ubuntu policies or decisions. The podcast seems to be becoming a bit of a mouthpiece for Canonical. The recent button controversy is a key example. How can you all claim to be ambivalent about such a major change? And more pertinently, the way it was communicated was completely ridiculous. The change seems to be a change for change's sake and doesn't really seem to have any merit. It is okay and indeed desirable to say that you don't agree or like uh, don't agree with it or like it. The closest we had was Popey pushing Ivanka about the Mac likeness of the new theme and Davy telling us how to fix the button positioning. I think Fab on Linux Outlaws tends to go off on rants and I don't always agree with him, but I like the fact that he speaks his mind. I'm really starting to doubt if you guys do. Linux Outlaws has replaced UUPC as my favourite podcast because I have grown to prefer Dan and Fab's commentary. Ironic given that I found their podcast from listening to you. Well, yeah. well, there's freedom mm. for you. Of course, Callum's entitled to his opinion. Even yep. though he could potentially be wrong. Mm. And I'm expressing my opinion there. Well, I think there's several points to, yes. to, to address there. Um, the uh, are we an official mouthpiece for Canonical? Far from it. No. Far from it. No. And uh, Canonical have never um, given us any money or uh, direct support or anything for the podcast, or even hosting as a mirror. You know, when yeah. you when you download this episode, you're not you'll never get it from a Canonical mirror at the I, moment. Yeah, I don't think he's uh, well. Hmm. I don't think he's saying that. You know, we're being you know mouthpieces of Canonical in that kind literal, of that yeah. literal sense. I think he's you know saying we're towing the party line. We're not. We don't. Um, we don't criticise Canonical and the Ubuntu project enough. I Maybe think, we're not critical enough. I think we're just dull, ambivalent people. <laughs> <laughs> well, they speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> but I mean, or, or not, if you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of the, of the button change, I mean, I think everybody gave a genuine opinion. My opinion I, 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 I don't think I did. No, I don't think I did. I mean, I would love to have, have an interview with somebody who had a good sort of... Um, justified reason that they didn't like the change for example but we haven't had anybody sort of that we've come across for uh, to do that so we, we did interview Ivanka who was obviously you know proposing the change I, I do seem to remember commenting on someone who um, had a very reasoned argument for the whole theme being not very good and he put it across he comes from a design background he knew what he was talking about and when he talked about what he was saying I thought actually he is right mm. um, regarding the actual buttons I wasn't necessarily for or against it, although when it initially happened, I wasn't ready to adopt that. Um, since then, I now have, and I'm used to it, yeah. and it's not much of a major issue. That was my impression of your blog post, Dave, was that you were saying, not that you have to do this, but if you want to, here's how you can do it. Mm. And I, I think that misses the point of of us, just because we're not ranting and, and raving. I mean, Fab does a good job of ranting and, and raving, don't get me yeah, wrong. Sure. But I don't think you should mistake a lack of sort of bile and, and, and vigour on our part for a lack of genuine sentiment. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we do, we are critical of Ubuntu as far as I, well, I was earlier about the fact that um, the new phone thing doesn't work on Android. So, you know, sometimes we are. Yeah. But I think, Overall, we all quite like the product, generally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if we didn't, we wouldn't, A, use it, and B, drive however many hours to get here to do a podcast about it. Mm. If we really hated it that much, then we'd all sit at home, go on Skype, and call ourselves Linux Outlaws. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Our good friends over at Linux Outlaws. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, but they, I mean... We sort of asked around last week what we all thought of the buttons, and we all just sort of said we weren't that bothered, big deal, whatever. But that's because we were asked about the buttons. But um, I think we probably agree that the the change could have been communicated better. Yeah, and um, we're yes. not disagreeing with um, Callum about that. No, I, I, that's I, something I that really gets my goat. There you go. There's a rant. <laughs> yeah, it's community communi- communication. I mean, how many times? I mean, and the thing He's is. Off. 
for, for no particular reason, <laughs> it, the community is often left out in the cold. But as years go by, they are getting better at it. I hope you're getting this, Callum. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I completely agree with Dave. I mean, the fact is that, that the change to the, to the whole theme, not just the buttons, the whole thing was communicated to a small set of people um, before it was announced to the whole, um, whole community. And even when it was announced, it was announced quite late in the cycle. Like, which, which was a bit bad. Which honest. was quite mm-hmm. bad. Um, and as other people have pointed out, in open source, you can't... I think Fab pointed this out, actually. You can't do an Apple, in inverted commas, mm. which is hold something you know, super secret and then just announce it on the world and go, there you go, that's what it looks like. Because it's open source and you've got lots of people involved in this thing and lots of people who want to contribute and have an opinion and to just announce it and say, there it is, that's what we're going to use. Oh, but that's the problem. It doesn't work. Just because it's open source doesn't mean everybody can... Uh, a, get involved, and B, have an influence. No, but there's there's a difference between some people and everybody. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying some people, like the people who man- uh, who um, maintain applications which are adversely affected by moving buttons or applications which are adversely affected by having a dark theme by default. Or But you, you can either keep something quiet or you can't. You can't sort of tell a hundred different people because they might be affected and not one of them's going to mention it to somebody. Just well, that's pretty accident. much what they did. They they kept it quiet for for a long while. I mean, we all knew there was artwork stuff maybe happening. Oh, the artwork stuff, but things like the buttons. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but they, they told a small set of users before. Mm. And, by, and by small, I'm talking 100 probably yeah. max. Okay. And some of them were taken, like Dave was taken to you know, canonical HQ and heard about it from... Blindfolded. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're still in the helicopter. <laughs> but, you know... But he doesn't speak for Canonical. I, I agree. It, it was badly communicated. I yeah, think. I'd been interested, and I think a few people mentioned that they'd be interested in having seen the um, usability studies or research or mm-hmm. things, um, just because if it was, I mean, presumably, assuming that's public knowledge or it's not confidential. But, I mean, on the whole, um, what Simon was mentioning, that you... Yeah, it is a community distribution in a sense, but it's also a commercial no. distribution. No, it's not community distribution at all, as far as I'm concerned. And I just said, and it's a commercial distribution, although there's a community around it, and a bun- and Canonical pro- presumably have a strategy for making it like the premier distribution ever or something. So uh, they're not going to reveal the whole business strategy, so we can't expect that. And part of it is because a lot of this is, A, unknown, and B is planned for years from now. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff that you know we've seen over the last six months, Mark was talking about months and months and months ago, and maybe even over a year ago, he was talking about the changes that he wanted to have in Ubuntu. So this stuff is planned in the long term. So anyone who gets, you know, kind of uppity about what happens in this release, yeah, it's important. This is LTS, and this is the current release that we have to deal with right now. But think longer term. This, you know, this is aiming yep. to be the desktop of choice over in within the next three, four, five years. So Callum was uh, a bit annoyed at us about us being yep. a canonical mouthpiece yep. and us not pushing people hard oh, enough on the, on the button changes and stuff. Um, but I think really we need to just sort of wrap up and say actually, you know, you do get our genuine opinions. We don't um, couch them um, to make anybody at Canonical happy. Um, we appreciate that people from canonical come and do interviews with us and hopefully that's useful for listeners as well but we're certainly not uh under any corporate mouthpiece and they don't get approval on our episodes before we put them out and mm. all that sort of stuff um we've got trademark uh, to approval to use the name ubuntu in our podcast name but that's the only communication we've had them about with about, with them about the podcast at all I think. and they have given us prizes for the yes year. that's true they've given us some prizes but you know no strings attached we should get some new ones off them soon, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's ask, nice the, ask them before we put this out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want some new stickers for my laptop. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay, that'll be good. Isn't Ubuntu wonderful? <laughs> yeah, it's great. I yeah. don't have a problem with that. I don't know what yeah. everyone moans about. And that's all your feedback. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including our voicemail number, Twitter, Identica feeds, Facebook, IRC channel, and all that sort of stuff. And we had a lot of people turn up in the IRC channel recently. It's been quite busy. Yeah. Um, and we'll see you next time, I think, which will be the last time before our camp. See you next wow. time. Thanks for see listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.